from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm Mary Jane Deeb, Chief of the African and Middle Eastern Division, and I wish you all a happy Nowruz. We are uh, celebrating today Nowruz with a special cultural program on uh, Azerbaijani uh, culture and food. And uh, I just want to say that every year, uh, the African and Middle Eastern Division, uh, which uh, is responsible for the collections and for serving uh, those collections uh, from 78 different countries, um, is uh, here uh, and uh, collects materials from Azerbaijan that it serves as well. Now, why we celebrate Nowruz it is because it is a secular festivity, sacred to the Zoroastrians, but in fact celebrated not only in, uh, in Iran, the Persian world, the Persian-speaking world, but also throughout Central Asia, in, uh, from Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and uh, certainly uh, in Azerbaijan. It is also celebrated uh, in, uh, in India and among some of the people in Iraq, uh, in Turkey, in Turkmenistan, and many other places. And every year we do something special. So this is a very special uh, event today. In 2016, for example, um, we celebrated it at the White House. We were invited by Mrs. Obama and we had a display and a special Nauru's lunch uh, at the White House. In 2015, we had a special presentation uh, by Dr. Syed Hossein Nasser, and many of you know him, at George Washington. In 2014, we opened a big uh, exhibit on a thousand years of the Persian book. Uh, a year earlier, we had a film uh, on the Shahnameh, so uh, year after year, we have unique programs that uh, celebrate uh, New Year, celebrate the beginning of spring. I know it's not very auspicious with the snow outside, but we do what we, what we can to bring spring to everyone and uh, to bring spring um, through Nauru's, through the programs, through the food, through the culture, which is so rich and so wonderful, and you'll hear much more about it today. We are delighted to be co-sponsoring this event today with the Embassy of Azerbaijan. And uh, the Embassy has been absolutely wonderful, has a, a, a fantastic team. We have a young lady, uh, Ferdoun, here, who has been a dynamo, pulling this together in a very short period of time. So I want to thank the Embassy of Azerbaijan for also making possible this wonderful um, uh, menu and event uh, uh, today. We have with us, and we are honored to have with us today, the Ambassador from Azerbaijan. Uh, His Excellency Elin Solimanov was appointed Ambassador of the Republic of Azerbaijan to the United States in October 2011. Prior to that, for over four, five years, Mr. Sulemanov had been the nation's first Consul General to Los Angeles and the Western States uh, leading team, which established Azerbaijani diplomatic presence on the Western coast. He's a graduate of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in uh, Medford, Massachusetts, and holds a graduate degrees from the political Geography Department of Moscow State University in Russia and from the University of Toledo, Ohio. Mr. Solimanov has, uh, His Excellency uh, uh, Ambassador Solimanov has authored numerous articles 
and is a frequent presenter at academic events. He's fluent in several languages, and now we'll ask him to be fluent in English and, <laughs> and welcome you all. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Deep. Uh, this is a great honor to be here. My English is heavily accented, so I'm not sure how fluent I'm going to be, but I'll ask you to bear with me. The happy thing is going to be very short. So, uh, Ms. Deep, thank you so much for partnering with us. It's a great honor to be speaking in this marvelous hall. We all know about the Library of Congress from our childhood, from different things, but now we're finally presenting uh, here in a partnership with the Library of Congress, thank you so much, Ms. Deep. Thank you for, to your division. Thank you to your team. Thank you, Ms. Weeks, for being with us. Thank you. I actually have a book itself to present to you, but, I, uh, but what we'll do, we'll present, but I'll also ask them for later to, later to sign it. So you have it actual signature. We could have pre-signed it, but we thought it would be better if she signs it in your presence. So, Ms. Deep, thank you very much. This is thank the book you. itself. Thank you so, so much. Thank so you. thank you, thank you for your partnership. And Farida could sign it. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> so, That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So and uh, yeah. and while the ladies do that, let me say a couple of words. First, first of all, we are very proud to partner with uh, Farida Buiran on this book. Uh, it was a joint project in which we didn't really do anything, and she did all the work. But we were very grateful. Uh, this is the first book of its kind. She will tell you more about this. Uh, it's not surprising that this book actually was written in California because when you look outside the nature and the weather of Azerbaijan and the, and the, and the fruits and the meat and all this is probably more like California than elsewhere, anywhere else. So, uh, Ms. Buran, I'm not surprised that you were inspired to do that in, in, in the worms of Los Angeles rather than, <laughs> rather than elsewhere. But uh, we could have called this conversation a taste of Novruz. As uh, Ms. Lip pointed out, it's very important to realize that today we are in the second day of the last week of Novruz. I know it sounds strange for people who don't follow this, but we're very religious about this, very, very, very committed. So what happens is every Tuesday before the, no the actual Novruz, which is a solar equinox, which is a real beginning of spring, uh, we dedicate ourselves to eating a lot of fattening foods, sugar, carbohydrates, and jumping over various uh, burning articles, mostly, mostly fire. It's good for you because it cleans your soul. Yesterday we did that as well because that's a celebration of the beginning of spring. Don't be fooled by the cold weather. Actually, sun will be soon on, I think it's on Monday, right? The night from Sunday on Monday, it will be solar equinox. The spring begins and no more cold weather, I promise you. That's been true for centuries. That's been true for thousands of years. But the celebration of Novruz is not possible without the food, because that's very much the heart of the Novruz celebration. You, you jump, you eat, you cleanse your soul, and you get many more carbohydrates back. So, Ms. Buran will be talking about this. But what Ms. Dib also said is very important. I think in addition to the new and the beginning of the celebration of the actual equinox, Novruz is a, un is a, is a celebration of unity. It's a unity of the Iranian culture, Azerbaijani culture, culture of people of Central Asia, the Caucasus, it's so much. And throughout, in fact, in places like Middle East, Iraq, and in Russia, the people like uh, in Tatarstan and Bashkortostan. Everybody has their own specificity of the things. Um, I, I believe that we really have the best pahlava. People believe that they have the best cloth. Uh, people boil the best eggs and heat the eggs together. Everybody has a different thing. But what it, is, what, what it does, it unites people in many ways. And it's a, it's, it's a fascinating feeling when you go to different places, quite far from each other, actually, in terms of distance, and people celebrate together, celebrate in a way which is so familiar for each of us. So I think that's, in a way, uh, a, a, a great opportunity for us to think about this as a unifying force, especially during this week of celebration. Now, there's something which is also special about this book, and you would notice that. Not only the celebration brings us all together, the food. If you look at the specificity of food, it's actually very common to so many of our neighbors, so many of our friends, so many of our partners. In a way, when we say Azerbaijani food, it's also been developed under different influences and has influenced others. So in a way, unification of food is also a very good thing. And uh, in addition to the talk by Ms. Buran, I also hope that we could actually have some of it here because they told me that they serve, will serve some food. So I look forward to 
listening and also eating as well. So thank you very much and good luck with your presentation. Thank you. Happiness, Hoshkeldiness. So, uh, <laughs> for uh, uh, the others, that is welcome. And uh, on behalf of my colleagues, and in particular, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, Chief of the African and Middle East Division, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone. I'm Joan Weeks, head of the Near East Section, who's the sponsor of today's program, along with the Embassy. And we're very pleased to present this program on pomegranates and saffron, a culinary journey to Azerbaijan. But before we start our program, and very quickly before we introduce our speaker, I'm just going to give you a little brief overview of where you are. Uh, this is a custodial division. And we have three sections that build and serve collections from all around the world. We cover 78 countries and more than two dozen languages. Um, the Africa section covers all of Sub-Saharan Africa. The Hebraic section covers Hebraica and Hebraica worldwide. And our Near East section covers all of the Arab countries uh, in North Africa, Turkey, Turkic Central Asia, Iran, Afghanistan, and the Muslims of Western China. So you see it's quite extensive. And we hope that at some point you'll come back into our reading room and use the collections for your research. I'd also like to invite you to try out our blog, where our specialists write special events and stories about our collections, and like us on Facebook. Um, and that way you'll find out about future events. And now, um, I'd also just like to let you know that if you ask a question at the end, you're implicitly agreeing to be used on the video that will be uploaded on our website. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Barry Dabururan, who dreamed about creating her own cookbook and finally published it after seven years of hard work and obsession uh, determination. She was born and raised in Baku, Azerbaijan, and moved to the United States at the age of 24. Barry Da holds a BA and MA degrees in English and literature from the University of Languages in Baku, and an MBA from California State University at Long Beach. She is a writer behind the blog uh, azcookbook.com, where she shares recipes and stories from her native Azerbaijan, and her book, Pomegranates and Saffron, A Culinary Journey to Azerbaijan, has won five prestigious awards. So without further ado, let's welcome Farida to the podium. Thank you, Mrs. Weeks. Thank you, Mrs. Deeb. It's, uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. You've been very supportive of my work since the early days when I started writing the book. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to be here in the Library of Congress. Coming from LA, this is a really big thing for me. So um, I'm very honored to speak about the topic that I love a lot. It's Azerbaijani cuisine. So thank you very much. And before I begin my presentation, I'd like to mention, we have stickers on, under four chairs. Uh, so four of you will win my cookbook, and I will be happy to sign them for you. So um, do we do it at the very end? Because everybody's reaching <laughs> for the stickers. So four people, lucky people. <laughs> uh, and I'll sign it for you after my presentation. While they're looking for the for that thing. Okay. Um, in 2007, when I had just started researching Azerbaijani cuisine for my cook for my uh, for my book, I stumbled upon this uh, beautiful quote by Anya von Bremsen. She's a prominent food writer, and I saw this quote in her famous book Russia, Please to the Table. The quote read, "Azerbaijani cuisine is." perhaps the most distinct, yet the least known of all three Caucasian republics. So this idea really stuck with me, and I carried it through the seven years of my work in, on the book. I thought I, I really wanted to deliver the beauty of Azerbaijani cuisine, the diversity of it, uh, how it's deeply steeped in the culture of people populating its territory, in the history of people. 
uh, living on that land. So and I hope I achieved my, my goal. Um, and after seven years of working, the book was published. So what is Azerbaijani cuisine and why is it so distinct? What makes it different from other cuisines or what makes it common from, uh, with other cuisines? Uh, my lecture will give you a very brief overview of the country. You're, most of you are probably familiar with it. I'll be very brief. And then I'll talk about the cuisine, it, the techniques uh, of cooking, general ingredients that we use in the cooking. Then I'll talk about the evolution of Azerbaijani cuisine throughout the century. And then we'll talk about special days and food traditions. Uh, this, is a, this is Azerbaijan on a big map, so you can see it's a very small country on the crossroads of Asia and Europe. Um, uh, it's bounded by the Caspian Sea where the capital Baku is located, and our neighbors are Iran, Turkey, Armenia, Georgia, um, and uh, Turkey. This is uh, the map of Azerbaijan. I don't want to, uh, to talk too much about the country because you probably already know I'll, I'll switch to to the country overview, uh, to the cuisine overview. So what are some of the main uh, factors in Azerbaijani cooking? Uh, one of them is seasonality factor. We use fresh ing ingredients, um, summer ingredients in the summer, uh, winter ingredients, feeding for the winter in, in the winter time, hearty meals in the winter, light vegetarian meals in the summer. So this is a very important aspect of Azerbaijani cooking. And also it's very used to use fresh ingredients. We go to farmer's market uh, very often. Uh, you know, farmers market operate every day over there. It's not like here, I don't know how it's here, but in LA it's once a week. So uh, in Azerbaijan it's every day and everybody shops very frequently for the ingredients to use in the cooking because cooking is made from scratch on a daily basis. Then there is a concept of sweet and sour in some of the dishes. And this is something that came to our cuisine from Persia, from the times Azerbaijan was, was part of the Persian Empire. Uh, we blend, we mix uh, sweet with sour. For example, some rice pilafs, the toppings for, for some rice pilaf, they have apricots, but at the same time, the topping may have sour plums. So it's a beautiful combination, it's delicious, but it's also for the purpose of, uh, to balance the richness of the dish, especially if it's a meat dish. And also sour uh, ingredients help with the digestion of the food, so there is a medicinal property as well. Uh, there is also a minimum waste, idea of minimum waste. For example, if, when we slaughter uh, sheep, we, use, we try to use as much of it as possible. We make kebabs. Then with, uh, with the innards, we make something that's called jizbiz. Uh, it's really good. Unless you're a vegetarian, you won't like it. But it's really delicious. And then the, the feet and um, head is simmered for a long time until we obtain something that's called hash. It's very good for hangovers, but not only. So it's, it's <laughs> I love it. I don't have hangovers, but I love it. Uh, so, and, and also wastes are sometimes used in, uh, for their medicinal properties as well. You can, um, what else? And tradition of food, food preservation is very important. We do have a lot of jarring during the summer months, but we also have a very uh, old tradition of preserving food when there were no refrigeration possible. For example, uh, we make govurma, which is lamb fried in its own fat and then stored for winter. Then it's used, uh, scooped out with its fat and added to the dishes. Then we have something uh, that's called gahaj or guru at. Uh, it's, um, it's basically large pieces of meat, salted and dried. Then you can use it in dishes as well, especially pasta dishes. Uh, in the coastal regions, uh, they dry fish and use it in the winter time as well. Uh, cooking on a saj is very important. Saj is a, uh, is a very interesting uh, utensil. It's a, it's a, it's a pan. We'll, I think we have a picture of it in the later slides. Um, it's basically it's a dome-shaped vessel where you bake and cook at the same time. On one side you bake breads, on the other side you cook uh, savory dishes. Um, and I'll, I'll show you the pictures after that. Okay, so these are the pictures of, this is a pomegranate car, a trunk in a, they sell pomegranates in the trunk of a car. I snapped this picture last year in Baku during the pomegranate season. And there are lots of fresh herbs in the bazaars. And this is um, a dairy seller that came to our neighborhood in Baku uh, and I was Skyping with my family. I just took a picture of her. She was very happy to be in the presentation. So this is something that's very common there as well. People, you know, neighborhood vendors, they go to the neighborhoods and sell something. This is our vendor over there. Um, I talked about this and I forgot the slides. So this is kofta. Uh, on the right you can see kofta. It's a huge jumbo meatball uh, with sour plum inserted in the middle. This gives it a nice tart flavor, also takes away the richness of the meat and helps with the digestion. And the hash that I talked a little earlier, the 
feet and tripe and <laughs> so it's on, on top. And on the bottom you see uh, cheese that's stored in the sheep skin. It's called motal pendir and it has a very distinct and uh, distinct flavor. So we don't waste any part of the animal. And I talked about this. This is dried meat in the middle. That's how it looks. And dried yogurt. There's also a tradition of drying the yogurt for the mint winter month, months. When the yogurt is strained and there is no liquid, they shape it into cones or uh, circles or rounds, and then they dry it under the sun. Then they use it in pasta dishes. Uh, cooking on a such, you can make, uh, in the middle, you can see flatbread stuffed with meat, fresh herbs. On the right is uh, such cooked lamb with vegetables that I took this picture in the region of Gabala in Azerbaijan. It's a beautiful region. And on the left you see, uh, this is Azerbaijani crepe. It symbolizes the sun. Um, when you pour the batter in the middle, it, it spreads around and you can see that it lo looks like the sun rays. Um, br bread making is very important as well. Bread is a very impor important aspect of uh, Azerbaijani cuisine. It's revered, it's sacred. Uh, it's been prepared in Azerbaijan for centuries, according to archaeological uh, discoveries. And uh, archaic methods were, that were used back in the time were really archaic. The uh, pieces of dough were basically baked in the ground. Uh, a hole was made in the ground. Embers were, you know, the uh, wood would, uh, fire would start there. Then uh, when the embers were hot, a piece of dough would be just put on top of the embers and then the dough would be covered with leaves and the bread would bake. But this is a very archaic method. Later on, of course, with time, other methods came. You can see here um, a brick oven, which is called kura, a big one. Uh, in the middle, it's tandoori oven. It's very common in Azerbaijan. Uh, and you basically, you, you slap the dough against the wall of a heated tandoor and the dough doesn't fall. It just stays there until it's nice and golden. And on the right, uh, it's lavash, flatbread baked on a sudge. Um, when I was researching for my cookbook, I realized how diverse the Azerbaijani cuisine is. Um, my family is from different parts of the country, from Ordubad, from Balakan, Zakatala. They are really, uh, I call it a triangle. One part is here, another here, and I am from Baku. Uh, so the cuisines of all these regions are very different. And um, as I researched for the book, I realized how diverse it is, not only uh, within the regions, but also there are many cuisines of ethnic minorities, the population of Azerbaijan. Um, for example, I found out that Moroccan Russians that came, uh, that came to Azerbaijan in the 19th century when they were expelled from Russia because of their uh, belief in spiritual Christianity, they settled in Azerbaijan. And there is a village of Ivanovka that's populated by, Russian, by Moroccan Russians. And they preserve their ways of cooking. They make lapsha, these noodles, the old-fashioned way. They make piragi of many kinds on Easter. And there is also the cuisine of uh, mountain Jews uh, that uh, came to Azerbaijan in the fifth century from Persia. They have a very distinct uh, cuisine as well that is a mixture of Persian cuisine, Azerbaijani cuisine. They have elements of different cuisine. Uh, so this, these are some examples of the diversity of the cuisine. We have many kinds of baklava. One in the picture is the guba style baklava. It's uh, different from Baku style because here the dough is made with rice flour uh, versus in Baku style it's made with uh, wheat, wheat flour. And that's stuffed. Oh, you can't hear? Can you hear well? Oh. Can you hear? Hello? True. Hello? Can you hear? Okay. Much better? Okay. Sorry. So, uh, so I'll, I'd like to talk about the history of Azerbaijani cuisine. One of the most important factors that uh, really uh, started the development of Azerbaijani cuisine is Silk Road. They started in China's Xi'an province in 183 BC, and it lasted through the 15th century. So all these caravans uh, bringing spices, rice, and all kinds of commodities passed through Azerbaijan. And there are lots of caravansarais. You can see in the picture, uh, they're basically inns that were built uh, to facilitate, to accommodate the traders that pass through, through Azerbaijan. This one is uh, in Sheki. And uh, on the first floor, uh, the trade was happening, the camels were resting, on the second floor, they were sleeping. It's like a hotel room. And um, so with Silk Road, new ingredients came. For example, spices came 
from India. We use a lot of cardamom in baking, for Novruz baking especially, cardamom, turmeric, uh, those fennel seeds, anise seeds, they came from India. And saffron came from Persia. So Silk Road really uh, played a big role in, um, in bringing a lot of ingredients to Azerbaijan. And saffron was very important, still is. Uh, it came, the earliest mention of saffron in Azerbaijan were in 9th century. It was really expensive, it was exchanged for gold coins only. And uh, not only ingredients came, but also uh, dishes came with silk rock. For example, we have this dish, which is, which is like a rice pudding. It's called firni. The same thing is made in Iran. The same, a very similar dish is made in uh, Pakistan, in northern India. So it's believed that it came with a silk road, and very good firni is made in, uh, in Sheki. I haven't really, uh, I, my assumption is that it came to Sheki first via silk road, and then it distributed to the rest of the country, but I haven't proven it. It's not proven yet, it's just my assumption. Um, tea becomes a staple as well. Azerbaijan is a very big tea drinking, um, they, we have a very big tea drinking culture. There's kettle on the stove all day long, and whoever walks in the door, we have to treat them to a glass of tea. So, but how did tea come to us? It came from China uh, via Silk Road again. Uh, the leaves originated in China, but until the 18th century, it was mostly an import. So we really didn't grow tea ourselves. It was mostly coming from other places, from China. Um, but in the 19th century, uh, in the 18th century, a first factory was established on the territory of Azerbaijan, and this is how uh, tea industry developed in the country. And uh, this is a glass of tea. You can see this is samovar, something that. Uh, that came from, from Russia, more of a Russian influence, although a very archaic uh, samovar was found on the territory of Azerbaijan in Sheki. So it's a little, oh, it's, you know, there are theories about uh, where samovar was for, first born. But the shape uh, resembles the Russian style. And the glass is uh, pear-shaped, just like in Turkey. We call it armud istakan, which comes from armut is pear, so it's pear-shaped. Um, and what else? So in, in the seventh century, uh, Arab expansion happened in Azerbaijan. With that, changes happened as well. For example, sharbat becomes, uh, became a more commonly used drink versus wine that was more popular before that because uh, the consumption of alcohol was prohibited in Islam. Uh, and you can see beautiful vessels here in the middle and on the right. This is where sharbats were served in the middle, this is called Aftafa, and uh, on the right, later on in 15, after 15th century, it was replaced with special bowls, intricately ornated uh, and designed. And Turkic migration was uh, also brought a lot of changes to, to the cuisine. Turks started to populate the ter territory of Azerbaijan from 16th to 11th century. More, more Turks came in the 11th century. And with them, they brought uh, their own cooking techniques, their own ingredients. Uh, they brought this art of making kebabs, a very, very down-to-earth uh, dish, but is, is very popular in Azerbaijan. Uh, they also brought uh, dumplings, which are believed to have traveled uh, through Central Asia uh, from China, and we have a lot of dumplings. You can see in the picture in the middle, these dumplings are called gurza, and resemble, they resemble Chinese jiaozi, uh, Chinese jiaozi or Japanese gyoza. In Azerbaijan, it's called gurza. Um, I think the name is, is very similar, although gurza also is the name of a snake. So, um, also you see erishta, which is believed to have traveled from Persia although uh, it's believed that the Turks really embraced it and made it their own. Uh, we use noodles, those are noodles basically. And there is also, um, we were also introduced to the use of yogurt, which is a staple in Azerbaijani cuisine. We uh, scoop yogurt on top of many dishes, vegetarian dishes, pasta dishes. You can see in the picture soup that's called uh, dovra. It's a yogurt, yogurt soup filled with lots of fresh herbs. It's very refreshing and delicious at the same time. Um, the most dramatic impact of, on Azerbaijani cuisine happened during the Soviet Union. What happened during the Soviet Union? You know, the Soviets had this idea of the same for all. So that means that uh, all the republics that were in, in the Soviet Union, part of the Soviet Union, 15 republics altogether, they had to have the same uh, eating habits, the same menus. So they introduced the same for all style. Um, cafeterias 
opened across the country and all of these cafeterias served Soviet-style foods, which include something you see in the picture, sasiski, for example, uh, the sausages, Soviet-style sausages. There was mashed potatoes, katlete, which is uh, meat patties, uh, buckwheat, um, and other similar Russian foods. So everything was controlled uh, from, from Moscow. That's where all the rules were made, all the decrees were adopted. So, and the cuisine was primarily based on the elements of Russian cuisine, although for festive occasions they, uh, they adopted elements of uh, other cuisines, for example, shashlik, uh, which, is, which comes from the word shishlik. It's a kebab. They adopted it from, as a, from the Caucasus and also from Central Asia. But mostly it was built on the elements of Russian, Russian cuisine. Uh, some not very good things happened during the Russian, uh, during the Soviet time. Uh, Rice production inclined. When I was researching for this for my book, I realized that uh, before the Russians, before the Soviet Union was established in Azerbaijan, there was a big uh, rice growing industry in the country. When the Russians came, when the Soviets came, they realized that this is a very laborious process to to grow rice, and it wasn't really fitting the Soviet style of eating. So a lot of plantations, uh, rice plantations, were abolished, and instead of them, cabbage plantations were started, uh, potato plantations started. So and so, rush, uh, so rice dishes that were very popular before and were really a part of uh, a part of the uh, cuisine before now they they became. Uh, they started to be served at the end of the dinner for something as, a, as something festive. Spice uh, spice bazaars also were demolished because Russian cuisine, the Soviet cuisine, did not require a use of a lot of spices, so spice bazaars uh, disappeared as well. And uh, new drinks came into existence, such as European style, style drinks. Sharbats disappeared, um, and the German winemaking tradition that existed before the Soviet came also uh, suffered as well. We, have a, we had a German population in Azerbaijan uh, that came, uh, that th 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 those were German colonies that were established in 19th century and they brought with them their winemaking skills and they started a uh, winemaking industry in Azerbaijan. Unfortunately they had to be exiled to Siberia and Kazakhstan because of the war of USSR and Germany. In 1941 they had to leave Azerbaijan. Uh, and these are some pictures of the German winemaking time. And new breads were introduced. Instead of traditional breads such as lavash, tandir, and others, Soviet-style loaves, long and round, were established across the country. And my grandfather actually owned one Soviet bakery. That's his picture. This is a picture of him. Uh, he, he ran away from the uh, Stalinist exile. He hid in another region. And uh, later on, he realized there was a niche for a Soviet-style bakery, and he started one. So that's him uh, down there. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, good things started to happen. We started to receive a lot of new foods from other countries. The first foods that came to Azerbaijan were Turkish food, foods because of the proximity of the regions and also because of the tastes were similar. So the first food that came to Azerbaijan, I remember in the early 19s, uh, 1990s when the Soviet Union had just collapsed was donut kebab, the spiraling meat that was really fancy back then, but it's really widely spread now. So, uh, and uh, Azerbaijanis started to reclaim their traditions of uh, preparing traditional meals more often now. In restaurants, they serve a lot of uh, things that were not served before. For example, PT. This is PT. It's a lamb stew with chestnuts uh, cooked in a, in a special pot. And special uh, days and food traditions, uh, you've, you've heard about Novruz a little bit, so I just want to say that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of traditions, a lot of uh, holidays, they have food traditions involved in them. So in weddings, a lot of foods, even when, uh, when two families meet, the families of bride and groom, there is a first ceremony when they agree to the marriage is a tea ceremony. They sweeten the tea, which um, means that the union is going to take place. And um, so the commemorations, for example, when death happens in the family, halwa is made, it's believed to soothe the pain of the grief. And this is my daughter holding a, a tray, a plate with samani. It's sprouted wheats. They, uh, they symbolize the abundance and fertility. And this is Baku style baklava, one of many styles of baklava that is made in Azerbaijan. You can see the different styles. You can read about the different types of baklava in my cookbook. This is the Baku style or Ganja style baklava. And this is Shekhar Bura. It's intricately designed with something that's called makash. And baklava actually symbolizes uh, 
stars. Shaker Bura symbolizes half moon. Uh, and this is Shorgogal, it symbolizes the sun. It's a flaky, flaky spice filled flat uh, red. It's, it, they're really good. And uh, the most important thing is the tradition of hospitality. Uh, we have a saying which says, a house without a guest is like a meal without water. And it's very true. For Westerners, our hospitality may seem like overwhelming because we push everybody to eat and drink, even if you are not uh, hungry, you have to eat. So it's, you cannot refuse the food because you have to be polite because there is so much labor put into preparing something for you. Always express gratitude to the host. At the very end, I wanted to read you this quote that I, that I found in Alexander Dumas' book, Adventures in Caucasia. I really love this. It really gives the gist of Azerbaijani culture. So this is what, is, what he said. The officer commanding the nearby village of Surahana came to invite us to take tea with him. Tea is hardly the right word for we found we had prepared an excellent supper for us, a Tatar meal of shashlik, pears, grapes, and watermelons. He also offered us rooms if we care to stay the night. Tatar, by the way, is how we were called during the Russian Empire. And uh, I hope you get to try this, uh, this sign of, signs of hospitality firsthand if you visit Azerbaijan. And uh, I hope you try the food of Azerbaijan. If you don't go there, we have food served here courtesy of the Embassy of Azerbaijan. Please um, enjoy it, and thank you very much for listening and for coming here. Thank you. I think we have time for a few questions, if anybody has a question for our speaker. Yes. <laughs> I, can, uh, I, I missed the first part. Yep. It's more uh, nationwide. For example, in Baku, there are restaurants that serve food from other regions of Azerbaijan. Something that, for example, you know, hadn't been, hasn't been served during the Soviet times, but now it's being served. So it's more on a, on a general, in general, yes. Any other questions, of course? Yes, Angela. Uh, I think there is. I haven't lived there for 15 years, but uh, I believe if you buy something that's, for example, my mom never buys chicken that's sold in supermarkets. She buys chicken from somebody who raises those chickens herself. Like it's village grown chicken. So naturally it doesn't have any hormones or everything. But I, as far as I know, some of the chickens that sell in the supermarkets have some bad stuff, just like here, you know, so. Yeah, there is a classification, just like here. Uh -huh. One last question, anybody? Well, I think we're all very anxious to taste some of this uh, cuisine. Uh, if you search under your chair, four people will find a red bow. And if you have a red bow, if you bring it up, Fairy Doll will sign your book. And the rest of us can go start through the line. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.